Now, if anybody doesn't know about Angola, Angola is a 18,000 acre plantation. It was a plantation since the 1800s, early 1800s or middle 18, 1800s, and they still ran it like a plantation. So, pretty much I could tell you I, I know what it feel like to be a slave. My name is Damien B. Um, I served 21 years in Angola. I re originally had a 40-year sentence for armed robbery. Um, so I grew up pretty much in Central City, New Orleans. We had my family had a grocery store, like in the middle of four projects, and um, this was prior to gentrification and. It was just, it was pretty wild around there. And, um, but they were there since the 60s. And at one time in the 80s, at the peak of business, they had 100 employees. So by being there since the 60s, um, they were, we were known in the neighborhoods and I could pretty much go around and play and, and hang out and play football in all, in all the neighborhoods around there, being like the only white kid around, you know? So, um, later in life, I started hanging out with, with guys, you know, in the neighborhood and stuff, and started experimenting with weed, and things escalated from there, you know? Um, didn't have to, started selling weed and, and drugs, just to, because I was there. They said, if you're going to hang out, you're going to do something. And I uh, had some pretty good friends. I mean, I'm not, I'm not putting any responsibility on, on, on that, on the environment or whatever, but it was a pretty rough environment. Uh, and that's how I got introduced to that lifestyle. So to put it in context, this was 92, around 15 years old, and to about... 97 that era right there and I pretty much come up like in the bling bling era if you couldn't tell with the gold teeth <laughs> so, uh, yeah it was pretty wild uh, New Orleans was the murder capital of the world at that time like it is now but it was a little different uh, I think it was a little more violent back then um, so I'm hanging around there, and, and around 98, the store closed. Uh, they had some Walmarts move in, and we couldn't compete with the Walmarts. I mean, my family, you know, I was running the streets, and um, and the store closed, and I continued to, to hang out around there. And at the time, you know, the, the stigma was, you know, you sell drugs, but you don't be a rockhead. Right? You don't smoke rocks. You're a rockhead if you smoke rocks. But it's cool to do heroin and stuff like that. You know? So that was the culture at the time. So I started dibbling, dabbling in that, you know, and um I got a connection with some ecstasy at the time and ecstasy was pumping at the time and I started dealing a good amount of ecstasy. Had an apartment with a with a girl, um, had cars, money, uh, money flowing in, and dude got popped and goes to the Fed. So I lose my connection, but I still have my, this is around, this is prior to, I mean, not prior, this is after 98. I was pretty much scoring from him, and that was my, that was my connection. And he got popped and went to the Feds, and that left me with no connection, you know. And uh, it had my back against the wall, and I was in that lifestyle, and not to do anything else, you know, because I, I wanted to I chose to be that, you know. Uh, that's the character I chose to play at the time, you know what I mean? So the money's not not flowing, you know. You know, so got to move into a smaller apartment, got to sell a car, get a get a. So it's going down and down and down. You know, um, try to get some connections. They don't want to 
give any any leeway you know they got my they, they foot on my neck they don't want to give me good prices and I started off robbing guys guys like that um, and that was that was my first introduction like to arm robbery and um so if I'm moving it so much, I expect you to cut your price to let me make more profit. But if I'm moving so much and you're not dropping your price, I feel like you're keeping your foot on my neck. You 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 pimping me. Yeah. You know. So at the time, my mentality is I got something for you. And um, things went bad, and, and and still things go bad like that. Yeah, I might have to pay him for that, but still, I don't have, still don't have a decent connection. So I still got my habit, I still got the girl, and I still want to live this lifestyle. But I can't uphold it, so the pressure's on me. I catch a charge, uh, I'm fighting a charge for, for marijuana, uh, and just the pressure was on me. You know, I, I had a, ha a big habit, and um, the girl playing games, you know, she'll play games, go get with this dude, and I'll play games, go get with that chick, you know, a toxic relationship at the time, and she pulled a move off that really got the best of me, and I decided that, shit, I ain't got nothing, uh, nothing to lose, I'm gonna rob a jewelry store and go to New York or something, I've never been to New York, I've traveled around, but I haven't I've been to you that way, above the Mason-Dixon, so, I got really high and I went into a jewelry store and things didn't go right and I got arrested and convicted. And I got convicted with a 40 year sentence for armed robbery. Well the 40 year sentence didn't just happen like that. So my family still had connections, right? So yeah, I went on, I went into a jewelry store on the main thoroughfare at like 1.30 in the afternoon you know, and it was really some clown shit that happened because I was too intoxicated. I had a partner with me. He jumped out the car because he said he'll do it, but I'm too high to do it. You know, it was some real clown shit. I had a lot of pressure on me, and I've never went in anybody's establishment. You know, I did the street shit, but I never, this was the first time going in somebody's establishment doing like this. I knew the, I knew the people from prior shit that, uh, that they, you know, you bring them stuff and they'll give you more than a pawn. They were a fence, pretty much. Mm -hmm. You know, you get jewelry from certain hustles or whatever, and they'll give you a better price than if you would go to a pawn shop or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, they'll, so they were kind of crooked, and from prior, from going in there, I noticed that they didn't have any security cameras, kind of backlogged it in my head. This was like a, a year or two prior to, to me going in there and, and robbing this establishment. And from the pressure on that popped up in my head, all right, that's a lick. And um, I just wasn't in the right frame of mind. I had too much going on. And, uh, but it was meant to be, everything was meant to be. So I went in there, it didn't turn out right. And uh, someone got a license plate from a car that I had parked around the corner. I had it blocked, blacked out, but I didn't see the people. They had some roofers on, uh, across the street and they came down and got the license plate. And the license plate was, was tracked and that's how I got caught. So, so I'm in, I'm in jail fight, uh, on this charge. My family, you know, raised, they, they raised me right. And, and they still had connections with people in the city and they were trying to make sure that I got the least amount sentence as possible. How old were you around this time? At this time I was 23, 23. No, I was 22. I made 23 in, in, uh, in the Paris jail fighting the charge. So when I hit Angola, I was 23. So I was 20, 22 when I got arrested. So I'm in, I'm in, um, in the Paris jail or the, or the county, if anybody, we call them parishes down here. And my family's trying to get 15 years because the minimum sentence for armed robbery was 10 years and it's an enhancement of five years if you have a, a gun. All right. So they're trying to get me 15 years and it was working out. Well, my dad, my uncle, at the time, he was manic depressant. He had, and he was smoking crack. 
So I'm in there. He's aware of the, of the situation with that. So he tried to use that as leverage. He, he tried to, he went to my dad and tried to get money to get high. My dad told him no, he got mad. So he goes to the news people and the, the uh, investigative news people, you know how every channel has an investigative news people and tells them about this. So the people go to the judges chambers and to the people that my dad know asking them what's going on, all right? So at the time, I'm in the blind. They don't tell me this because they don't want to get me upset, right? So I'm in prison. So it comes time for trial. Either cop out to, to whatever they offer or take it to trial. So me being in the blind, I'm thinking the lawyers and everything is supposed to be set to where I could get um, the least amount of time as possible. I know I'm about to go do 15, all right? So that's what I was going to take a plea bargain to is 15 years. But me not knowing what my uncle did, that built some anger toward, of course it would, you know? I mean, what's going on? I'm be trying to help you out, and this dude's blowing this shit up with the eyewitness news investigators. So the lawyer comes to me. I'm in the box with all the other inmates. It's either time to take a plea or go to trial. He offers me 60 years. I said, no, I'm not taking 60 years. You would take it to trial, all right? So I'm like, what's going on? You know, I'm looking at my family. I'm like, what, what in, in the audience? And I'm like, I ain't taking that. So they take my dad and my grandpa, the lawyer, out in there and tell them, cut a check for 10 grand, I could get it to 40 years. So he, the lawyers are working them now, working my family, all right? So they cut the check for 10 grand. They tell them every year under that would be a thousand more dollars. They said, get them 15 years. They were willing to pay to get me 15 years. So he acts like he's going to the judge's chambers, comes back and said, no, I'll, all I could do is the 40. So he just hustled them out of 10 grand, all right? So he comes back. This is all happening while in court, court set up, you know? The court's going on with other, other cases. I'm in there, so my lawyer's coming back to me. Now this lawyer is supposed to be having an affair with the judge, that's why we hired him, all right? My other lawyer, the first lawyer that my family got me, hooked me up with this one because he's supposed to have an in with the judge. The judge is a hard ass, all right? So, I'm, but I'm in a bind. I don't know what my uncle does, all right? So, he, and I'm confused because, you know, it, it, it's either cop out to a lesser sentence, to a plea bargain, or, or like, this is it right here. So I said, tell the dude, no, I'm not taking 60 years. So then he comes back, he did all that with my family, hustled him out of 10 more thousand dollars, comes back and said, all right, look, take 40. And me being, he says, take 40. And when it comes back on appeal, we got you. I'm still thinking everything's cool. And me being ignorant to the law at the time, once you take a plea bargain, that's it. So I cop out the 40 years. So it's the first offense, armed robbery, and the lawyer and all this situation, so my resentment's building, all right? This is the base of a resentment for when I hit Angola. Uh, I got resentments against the system and all that, you know, and we got plenty of people to feed those type of resentments, fuck the system and all that shit. So my heart is very resentful and I'm in denial. It's easier to hold on to the resentments than deal with the denial of the fact that I got myself in this situation from the begin with. You know, it's, it, at the time, it's easier, to, it's easier to build resentments and a stone heart instead of take responsibility and a look at yourself at the time. All right, so I get the 40 years and come back on appeal, I get shipped to Angola. All right, now if anybody doesn't know about Angola, Angola is a 18,000 acre plantation. It was a plantation since the 1800s, early 1800s or mid late 1800s, and they still ran it like a plantation. So pretty much I could tell you I, I know what it feels like to be a slave, you know what I mean? And not to be in any, um, <laughs> I just laugh at myself and it, it's kind of uh, funny, but I, I, I kind of want to get into, a, a, and this is kind of like not politically correct, but I want to get into like a, a conversation with somebody about wokeism and stuff like that. And you know, they're gonna, I have a little surprise for them, you know what I mean? I know what it feels like to be a slave, picking cotton, picking okra, swinging a swing blade in the fields while you got a 
the man on the horse with a, with a gun over you. You know what I mean? So that's a hell of an experience. So I get to Angola. I got a 40-year sentence. So I get to Angola, and um, you get tested when you're in Angola, when you first get there. You know, you, you, they, people want to see if, if you're a man, if you're going to be a man and stand on your own, or you're going to be for somebody, pretty much. Um, and it's, it's just like one, it, I look back, it's like one long day. You know what I mean? So after I get there and people see that, you know, I mean, I'm not looking for no bullshit, but if it comes uh, and it, it's no way out of it and it has to be ha addressed, I'm gonna stand up for myself. So some old timers kind of, you know, as, as a few years pass by, we're talking 21 years. So as a few years pass by, you know, some old timers kind of look out for me. They were in, uh, you know, they've been there for 30, 40 years. You know, the majority, 85% of people in Angola have life sentence. I went there with a 40-year sentence, and uh, some of the old timers seen that I was a stand-up guy, and they kind of gave me a line and pulled me out the field, got me an automotive school, just to get to me at the time. It was just to get out of the field, out of field work. So I was like, "Cool, yeah, you know, get, if you could pull me to automotive school out the field, that'd be great." So I got to uh, go to automotive school, and after a while, I took a liking to it. And I started fixing cars and, and uh, getting certifications, and they actually got me into a college there, uh, Louisiana Technical College. I graduated with uh, automotive in automotive technology. And parallel to that, I've seen where, all right, so just for more, for more context, so in the 18,000 acres, they have a subdivision there that the correctional officers live. Actually, they don't pay rent, they don't pay water, they don't pay anything. It's like 100 houses maybe, and it's a whole subdivision where they actually live on the farm. All right, they call it the farm. And you're talking generations of correctional officers from back in the early 40s and stuff like that. You know, they, their grandpas worked there and stuff. So, why not, all right. So these are the cars that we're working on. All right, their cars. And certain, certain ones, I'm, I'm, I said that to, to emphasize a lesson that I learned with resentments and shit like that and, and perception. So they had a guy, at, and also parallel to this, I'm cutting up in prison, all right? So I'm learning this, but I'm also doing the day, but I'm also, I call it playing prison with a prison mentality, you know, selling drugs, doing drugs, selling tobacco, whatever. This was before tobacco was, was outlawed in prison. So, and they didn't have cell phones to sell yet either. So, but I'm, I'm selling drugs, using drugs, um, just playing prison. I call it playing prison. But I always like to read, so I, I've read different, a lot of different subjects. I enjoy uh, physics, at the, I enjoy philosophy, and, and at the time it was automotive stuff, so I immersed myself because he got nothing else to do. So I always like to read, and that was my escape. That was my escape, my mental escape from prison. So I'm going to school, a guy made trustee, and they got a private enterprise in Angola also. It's called Prison Enterprise. It's probably owned corporations that you, a corporation that uses inmate labor under the guise, I feel, of, but it, it does work. It, I can't say under the guise, but they use inmate labor because they're paying us like anywhere from four cents to 20 cents an hour just to say that it's not slave labor. Right. All right. So, he noticed that I, that I graduated from automotive school and he knows that I, he's seen something in me that I could do this stuff. And he pulled me to the side and he used to talk to me. He said, look, man, you don't have a life sentence. You're going to get a chance to get out of here. You know what I'm saying? Learn this shit and that way you'll have something to do when you get out. All right, you can survive. And, uh, but in my mind, I see, at the time, and being immature, I'm not looking at 
a release date of 2041. You know what I mean? I'm living for the t today. And the more that you learn and work on these free people's cars that live there, when I get in trouble and get busted with drugs and sent to solitary confinement, they're not gonna let me sit in solitary confinement for a year. They may let me sit for six months and come pull me because I'm a valuable asset now because I work on their cars for nothing. All right? So I seen the game. So if I learn this shit, I'm violating, and when I get popped for violating, they'll come get me out of the fucking solitary confinement, which has been outlawed since then. It was Camp J, and that was some rough shit. So that's 23 hours in a cell, one hour out to go take a shower, and that's it. And you're back there with guys. This, these are guys that can't socially adapt to anything and, and uh, criminally, criminally insane type people, and this is where they shove them. And they got guys that have been solitary confinement at the time for 20, 30 years. Oh, God. All right? So these are the guys that's in your, 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 your it's, a, it's, a, it's a tier with like 15 cells, mm -hmm. see, like this. So these are the guys, and they, and they play all kind of psychological mind games and try to bring you out there. And the way they fight back there, they throw feces and piss on each other because you can't really physically get to them. Some of them could come out the cuffs, catch you in the hallway, while you cuffed up, going to the hospital or something, and deal with you like that. But, and it's, it's rough. So, I've been to Camp J two times, uh, dealing with that before they outlawed it and, uh, and closed it down. Because uh, they, they had all kind of cases, sensory deprivation, all kind of things that a, a solitary confinement could deal with your mind. So, I'm st after I get out of that, I'm still violating, still learning, though. So the guy that took a liking to me, he started working for Prison Enterprise. And Prison Enterprise, if you could, if, I'm trying to paint a picture to the scale of this. So Prison Enterprise, LSU has an agriculture department up there. That's where they grow the GMOs, genetically modified crops. And they, you know, they do their experiments up yeah. there. So Prison Enterprise is the ones that cut the crops with their, with their um, industrial farm, farming equipment, big uh, combines and, and big sprayers and huge tractors. So the guy pulled me out there and taught me how to do diesel mechanics on 18-wheelers, semi-trucks, heavy equipment, he taught me hydraulics, and he put me on the computer aspect and diagnostics dealing with engines, with diesel engines. He said, this is where the money's at when you get out all the other shit you can learn that, uh, later. This is where the money's at. So the guy's teaching me. Let me rewind a little bit back to a lesson in resentments and perceptions. So we were at automotive school, and one of the colonels that sent me to Camp J, that he, he, had, he, had a, he, he had it out for me. He knew I was violating, so he did all kind of undercover covert shit and popped me and sent me to solitary confinement. A couple of years pass by, I get out, go back to automotive. See, every time I get pulled out, I go back to automotive school, all right? So he brings his truck in, and I tell my, my mentor, that, that would be my mentor, the dude that was teaching me the shit at the time. I said, man, I'm not working on that dude's shit. That dude sent me to fucking solitary confinement and pop, man, fuck that dude. He said, look, bro, he pulled me off this side. He said, look, he says, it's not the truck's fault, the owner's an asshole. You're gonna have to get past that. And I took those, that simple concept and, and thought about it and it changed my perception. And my perception changed my reality. You know, it's not the dude's fault the owner's an asshole. You got, you, you're trying to reach a goal. You're trying to, you're trying to learn this shit. And, and, and at this time, this is a few years later, so my release date's t still 2041, you know. But that pivotal little token taught me a, a lesson about resentment and, and goals. Goals and ego. Ego will build a resentment and get in your way in your goals. And your perception is gonna change your reality. So I, I hung on to that and, and I said, well, fuck it, yeah, well, the truck, this is about the, me learning, this is a truck. The truck don't know the owner's a bitch. You know what I mean? So, uh, that's, 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 a, that's golden though, <laughs> that's golden. To, to goal setting and, and staying focused. That was a life lesson, yeah. yeah and I still learn, I still use that to this day. So the guy makes trust in and brings me to prison enterprise and he teaches me all this shit. 
So I'll, all the time, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. When I get popped and go to, to cell blocks or solitary confinement, you got two locker boxes you could keep all your shit in. Maybe about three feet long, uh, two feet wide. One of them has nothing but books. So when I get books and earplugs so I could drown out all the other noise and talking, mm. all right, that's the first thing that's, that's in that locker box. So when I get sent to the cell blocks, I got my little library in there and I read, 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 read. And something in me, you could call it God, Allah, Buddha, I don't care who it is, I mess with all of them. You know what I'm saying? I'm not putting a label on it, I just know something's there. And whoever, I could get along with anybody that believes in any type of, to the golden rule, you treat others as you want to be treated. And you know there's something supernatural there. Right. While I'm looking back in retrospect, I can see it. At the time, I couldn't see it. You know, the 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 thirst for knowledge with the books, me learning this shit just to get out of trouble. So when I get popped, I could come back and get out of solitary confinement. That wasn't a big picture, but something in me drove me to do these things. You know, and that fuck, I didn't have nothing else to do with it, but, but, but in retrospect, I, I see the big picture, you know what I mean? So, fast forward, now, we, now I've been doing this stuff for 15 years, you know what I'm saying? 15 years got to a point where, because of my drug use and stuff like that in prison, I woke up, one, I used to wake up and be like, man, you know, I got 15 fucking years in. My release date's still 2041. Why you woke me up? I just want to die in prison. I just want to wake up, just, I just don't want to wake up. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna kill myself or nothing like that, I'm, I just ain't built like that. But I'm cursing whoever that's listening, why the fuck you woke me up? You know what I mean? So it's to that point of desperation. I keep bringing my family. My family comes and sees me, and they got to come see me behind the gate every time I fuck up. You know, when I'm, because you can't visit face to face when you're in a cell block or solitary confinement. You got to visit a glass. You know, and I'm, my family's coming up there. My grandmother's getting old. My grandmother's, at the time, so this was 15 years in, she was 92 years old. She comes up there, and she pretty much raised me. She comes up there to visit at one, one, one day and said, look, I can't make, because you go up there, you got to get on the bus. You got to get shook down, go through metal detectors, get to a, you drive a long way, get to a camp, whatever camp that I'm at. Go in there, come back, get on the bus. So she can't make it. She can't do all that shit now. She's 92 years old and she told me at that visit, I can't make it no more, this is the last visit. So in my reality at the time, my grandmother, I had to mourn my grandmother. I had to go back to that dorm with 98 people and, not, and 100 degrees and mourn my, my grandmother. A few months later, my mom has COPD. She's getting overweight. She's not mobile anymore. She comes and tells me the same thing. She can't, I can't, so I'm not gonna see her no more. So at the time, I'm mourning my grandmother and, and, and my mom, and I got a drug habit in prison, you know? So I'm waking up like, what the fuck? Just, just, just let me die, let me OD, whatever the fuck, you know what I'm saying? Let somebody shank me up, whatever, that kill me. So my mentality, and I'm acting out, you know? I'm getting in fights and shit, and, and, and all kind of ruckus bullshit. So, um, at the time, so one day, I, I would have spurts, you know, where I would try to clean up and, and go the right path, and I'm still learning. I went to school for industrial generator um, work, and I got certified, a certified generator tech. That I started taking care of all the generators because a generator, I went to school and I got certified in residential and commercial electricity. So you take that, the electrical side of it and put it with a diesel engine and you got a generator. So I went to generator school and um, learned that and I started taking care of all the generators on the whole farm, big industrial generators. And I'm learning that, I'm reading, 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 reading. and. Um, and now, when I get in trouble, they come get me quick, a lot quicker now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
So a pivotal point was, like I keep saying, 15 years. At 15 years in, one day, I'm trying to bare knuckle it, straighten up. I'm d done with the shit. Now I've been on spurts like that, when you know, back up, stop fucking with certain dudes that's off in a certain shit, stop getting high. But, and this is one of the times. So I'm, uh, I'm getting off the, the iron pole. That's, that's, we call that, that's the workout area. And it's outside, so it's rusty and shit. So you get off of it and your clothes all rusty and shit. But it, that's cool. We, we, we built like that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm passing the education building one time, and I see they have a lot of people in there, guests from outside. And it just so happened to be like an AA meeting, you know? So I said, well, fuck, let me... I know they can't kick me out because, you know, so I go in there and I, and I meet a few people, get a few people's uh, phone numbers, put them on my list, and I started working the AA program in the steps of AA tour over the present phone. And um, that definitely cha changed my perception and, and taking responsibility of myself, you know, and um, it changed my reality. So... It's, it's deeper than just not messing with shit. It's, it's working on self, resentments, fears, and, 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 and self, period. So, I still had all these resentments toward the system. That was my last really hang up. And, and, and I learned that through working with this lady from AA. And resentments are a big killer. You know, a resentment, deep resentments will kill you if you hold on to them, they'll eat you from the inside out. So resentment to eat you from the inside out if you don't address them. And it still doesn't sound right. Well, a part of me still doesn't, it's, a part of me, it still doesn't sound right what I'm about to tell you. And a lot of guys that I grew up with couldn't really, won't relate to what I'm about to tell you, but this is, a, this is my story and it's my personal story. The only way that I got over that resentment was through gratitude. Gratitude that Angola had these opportunities for me to learn all this shit, all right? So the, it was funny, and, and, and like I said, it still sounds funny. The only way I could get over resentment for the system is to have gratitude for the system. And the reality is anywhere they have a book, rehabilitation is a choice, you know? In Angola, rehabilitation is a choice because they have these avenues. You gotta struggle and fight and learn and, and put work in to learn this shit. And everybody doesn't have a chance to get out. You know, I got a, a lot of my friends that they are still in there. Uh, they have life sentences and they're not gonna come home. All right? And I understand why they, they would think that was funny coming out of my mouth. But that was the only way I could get over those resentments for gratitude and this didn't happen right away, you know. So I stopped messing around with different shit in 2015, and I worked past that resentment. And my perception and my attitude and my reality changed at that point. A couple of months after I stopped messing around and started working with this lady, a law changed that gave me parole eligibility when I was had 20 years in and reached 45 years of age. And so at the time I was, I had 21 years in and I was 44 years old. So I, I went up on, on the parole board in April of 28, no, June, no, I'm sorry, April of 23, all right, I made parole. And I had to wait to June 11th to get out because I made 45. I had the time, but I wasn't 45 yet. So they get put me on the board. And from 2015, from my perception changing and working with this lady, my reality changed, my attitude changed, and I'm taking care of all the people's generator shit. The free people got to know me, and they seen I wasn't a bad dude. Like a lot of, of the other security know me from fucking up and they seen a change. And these people helped me on the board and, and talked me out of there. 
You know, they gave me a, they helped me make the parole board. And these are these are the same people that I was presenting. You know, the the, the slave drivers. You know, the that uh, you you know generations of, of slave drivers. You know, that's that's the mentality I had. But once they got to know me and I got to know them, they were pretty cool people. You know, I'm not running to them, giving them any information on nobody. They know not to ask me that. But just from a working standpoint of me working on their generators, the lights go out at 2 o'clock in the morning at the main prison. They got 1,500 inmates. They got 300 guards. These people need their lights on. So they come and actually they moved me and gave me like my own apartment. And I li lived at the electric shop outside of the outside of the prison. I mean, it's still on the prison ground, but I'm not on the compound. So they'll wake me up two in the morning and I'm, no lights on, pitch black. And I walk into this room, the generator room, and they got a generator the size of a school bus and I got to get this shit on. That shit used to be cool to me. You know what I mean? Right. And that's why they gave me the, the, the apartment. They gave me a bully, a dog to keep me company. They gave me uh, 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 I mean, it was like a, a refrigerator, stove, everything, you know. For the last five years, I lived pretty good because of the skills that I acquired. Then I got to know these dudes, and they, pretty, they became pretty cool people. And one of the guards, one of the, well, he wouldn't, he, he'll, he'll laugh. I used to fuck with him, calling him a police and all that shit. But he actually worked for the electric, uh, for, for uh, maintenance. And, um, I used to fuck with him because they make a, a call somebody escaping, he's going to look for him. So I used to call him a police and he used to get mad and shit. <laughs> but come, come to find out, he was in a program. He used to talk to me about AA and, and working on self and shit like that. So we got pretty cool and we're still cool to this day. And that's all from the perception, you know, and, and, and the, the perception change, you know, taking responsibility, you know, um, for my actions, you know. So I got a chance to get out. So, so, I mean, go ahead. So tell me this. You said it happened, you know, you lived that way for your last five years with getting these uh, luxuries, if you will, right. uh, of your own place to stay and uh, them depending upon you. Did this change, I imagine, your relationship with other inmates? Not really, no. Because my, my, my street cred was our, is, is secure. Already been I don't have to prove nothing to nobody. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't have to prove nothing to nobody. And they, they from, from growing up in prison, mm -hmm. I mean, they know what I'm not going to do. You know what I mean? But at the time, I'm not around anybody. You know what I'm saying? I'm not around anybody. I mean, I'll go in, they'll bring me to the compound so I can go visit my partners and stuff. But I'm not really mixing with nobody. But at the same time, Damon's solid, you know what I'm saying? So, but Damon don't mess with nothing no more, so Damon don't know nothing no more. Don't want to know nothing, you know what I'm saying? So, now I'm a parole, I'm trying to get out of here. I got a shot of parole. I'm definitely not messing with nothing, you know, but I'm constantly working on self, you know? So, I make parole in April. I got to wait to June 11th, my birthday. So my birthday falls on a Saturday. And these people talked to, I went, at first I went to a, they got a little um, program in Baton Rouge called the Parole Project for people that have done 20 years to try to reacclimate you to society, show you how to use a cell phone. But at the time I had illegal cell phones, selling cell phones, so I know how to do all that already. And I pretty, and, and so the free people in administration talked to them. They told me, all right, you get out on your birthday, but you're gonna have to wait till Monday. All right? That's what I thought. That Friday, they called me into the office and say, look, somebody, they didn't tell me who, somebody pulled some strings, you're getting out tomorrow on your birthday. You're gonna to go to the parole project, you're gonna to go to intake, and your daddy's gonna be on the way to come get you on your birthday. All right? So, I get out. My mama knows I made parole. But she doesn't know I'm getting out. She didn't know the day I was getting out. So I was able, the same lady that five years prior to that, that I went back and mourned her death because she told me she couldn't make it to visit no more, I walked into her house on my birthday in 2023, June 11th. And that was a hell of an experience. And my grandmother's still alive. I walked into her house. She's 97 years old. 
and I get to go and eat breakfast with my grandmother every morning before I go to work, you know, and it's just surreal and it's unbelievable. And um, so my transition, and that's just the beginning of it. That's just the beginning, man. Um, wow, man, that is crazy. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, if you had to mourn them, like, you're not going to see them. You know, right, and, example, and my reality at that time when they came and told me that they couldn't make it, that was the last time I seen my, my grandmother and my mom. That was, that was the reality at the time. And it's, it's just funny how whoever, like I said, I, 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 I fuck with all of them. <laughs> Buddha, Allah, all, everybody. Jesus, yeah. whoever. Supreme being, yeah. whoever. Yeah. And um. So you do you 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 do believe in something, but uh, you you're not sure uh, who's there, if you will. No, all of them cool. <laughs> I, I believe in all of them. So, and that's just that's just the beginning, dude. Um, from all that work for 17 cents an hour, mm -hmm. I get out, and I, I had the luxury. I had the luxury of family support, you know. I'm, I'm very grateful for that. That I wasn't forced to take this first job that I got. And I couldn't have fell in a better labor market than, than the need that they have right now and, and, and with my skills. All right, so I get out. In my mind, I'm going, I want to go work for Cummins Industrial Generator work. All right, so I, inter I interview with them. They scheduled me for a second interview. In the meantime, I narrowed it down. Coca-Cola wanted to hire me for diesel, mecha diesel mechanic work. Pepsi wanted to hire me. So right now, they're pretty much bidding for, so I'm interviewing them. They're not interviewing me at this point, all right? Look, Pepsi wants to give me this, what you could do. So after about a month and a half of doing interviews, I can't be a professional interviewer no more. I got to pull the trigger and get a job, mm -hmm. all right? So I'm going to Cummins for my second interview, and I happen to be riding downtown, mm -hmm. and I see, I don't really want to name it, it's a luxury import brand, okay. and they have vans that I don't have diesel engines in them. Mm -hmm. So I'm riding, so let me pull in here and see, I know these vans got diesel engines, let me pull in here. I know Diesel techs, you can't find them, all right? Mm -hmm. So I pull in there, I talk to them, yeah, sure, this and that, this and that, all right, yeah, come see me. So they got another office, and he said, well, I'm at the other office right now, and that's where all the big wigs are at. Mm -hmm. I said, well, look, I'll come to you right now. I'm not, I don't have to wait for you to come to me. I'll come to you right now. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I go to him, interview, and the guy, you know, I'm pulling up with my parole package pretty much. Mm -hmm. This is my, this is, I worked for, for the, did this, this, and this all in prison. So I'm putting uh, things I used on, par on my parole hearing. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's what I'm, that's my, that's my resume. Wow. All right. So, I, but I got all these certifications. Mm -hmm. I got a college degree in automotive technology. Mm -hmm. All the shit that I was doing to get out of, just to get out of trouble, mm -hmm. I got all these stacked up now. In retrospect, that wasn't the plan, that was a bigger plan, mm -hmm. you know? So I pull up and the dude that usually does the hiring said, well look, just because of your background, I know you could do this work and I'm gonna shoot for you. But just because of your background, I gotta kick it up to my C to the CEO, all right. So the CEO runs all the the all their businesses in the city, all right. So he wants to interview me and check my demeanor, my temperament before you know mm -hmm. they hire somebody coming out of prison for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I interview with this guy, interview with him. He said, "All right, I, you did a good interview. Uh, we're gonna get in touch with you." So the other guy brings me out. He said, "Look, he's gonna hire you, and this is what we offer you." Bam. And I tried to hold yeah, a straight I, face, yeah. and I said, well, thank you. I guess I work for you now. <laughs> yeah. the, the people gave me an unbelievable career, man. Um, six figures plus. Uh, wow. and, yeah, for the, for the so all the knowledge and all the reading and the choice of, well, at the time, it wasn't a choice of rehabilita rehabilitation. The, the, at the time, it was just to get out of trouble when I got popped. Mm. So it's the bigger picture in retrospect. Mm, your entire journey led to led to this now. point. Led to this point. So it's it's just it's just unbelievable. But I but so my transition has been beautiful. 
you know, my transition into society has been beautiful at all. So when you say divine intervention, it, it, divine intervention rings a bell with me like an immediate, just like a right now thing. This was like a walk with me, a walk with me throughout my whole life. You know, yes, it was there, like, like, the, like the, uh, like the uh, sand, the footprints in the sand poem, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. The guy asks God, where are you? I, I look back, I'm walking in the sand, I only see my, my, my footprints. Where are you? He said, well, I was carrying you the whole time. You know, those are my footprints. Those aren't yours. You know, so it's like that. It's not so much of a divine intervention because divine intervention is like one thing right now, this is intervening. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a long haul, mm -hmm. you know, and um, subjectively, like right now, it's kind of hard to see in a now. And that's what I'm trying to stay spiritually connected and do the right things in life so I could see it in the now. And it's hard. It's hard to see it in the now. I could definitely see it, and there's no denying in retrospect. But if I don't stay spiritually connected and focused, I'm trying to get to a point where I could see it in the now. I'm not completely there yet. It's a constant work. But um, my transition has been beautiful. Um, the only thing I'm having trouble with is dealing with emotions, like with women. You know what I mean? Because I went in when I was 22, and you put those in a box and locked it, lock it up. So my emotional maturity isn't there. And I'm making money, making good money, and they're at my top, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? So I'm building up some scar tissue, learning to let go of not being attached. You know, because I work, go to the gym Monday through Friday, and I'm in bed by 9:30. I don't play on after 9.30 in New Orleans, you know, no, you know, um, so I could get caught up in a rut dating, you know, certain women because you get locked into one and get attached to one because you don't have, I don't ha I don't want the time to go all through the rigmarole and, and, you know, starting over and getting to know, you know, so I've learned that uh, my, I had to peel up some of the scar tissue to be able to let go when it ain't the right shit. And I get impatient and just, Go for the easy, easy shit, and getting, uh, and that's where I'm struggling right now is getting scar tissue built up to cut them attachments. You know what I mean? I never had real life experiences to build emotional maturity. Yeah, how how is it with uh, people in general too? People in general, I, I I'm, I'm I don't feel like I have. I'm a pretty social guy, you know, social butterfly dude. You know what I'm saying? But uh, it's just the, you could talk all that shit you want. You know, all that shit you want. Oh, I'm a cutter. If you see the red flags and all that shit. But mm -hmm. after 21 years, bro, you know what I'm saying? You you finally, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Them endorphins and them, them hormones start to flow in and they get in your brain and all the logic in the world. That's where the emotional maturity comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, life experience. And those emotions you put in a box in prison. You know, I didn't even listen to R&B shit. Well, I know I had R&B and click that shit off. You know, and, and you don't deal with that. You know, if you don't have a lady that's stuck with you that's solid, and I respect women that stuck with dudes through prison, through their whole jokes and their whole time there, it takes a hell of a woman to do that. And that's, a, that's one tested through the fire. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I didn't have that, you know? So, it's just, it's just a learning experience, you know? I gotta, I gotta, I hate to put it like that, build up some scar tissue, some toughness on the emotions because of the lack of experience of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. But I'm aware of it, and that, that's, a, that's a plus. And um, shit, I'm going through it right now, you know what I mean? So that's still something you're working on. Yeah, that's, that's a work in progress, man. And I get caught in a rut. Like I said, you're working all day, and then you don't have to go. I could call on the weekend, all right, well, look, let's go do this. And then, you know, next thing you know, she leave her shoes there and her lipstick, and then, then that's how it starts. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm going going through right now, you know? And, um, but, dude, coming from where I come from, bro, that, that problem is beautiful. You know what I mean? So did your uh, dad come see you in prison? Oh, yeah. Did my he, he pops, uh, from beginning to the end, bro. Okay. Good, good, good. Beginning to the end. Um, how uh, would you say... Uh, 
So you had friends that you had in prison. Did you ever go back and see them? Oh, yeah. Uh, how was that experience? Yeah, I do. Every, so them. every April, every April and every October, they have a rodeo, a prison rodeo that they put on. And it's big. The, the stadium, they have a stadium that fits 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And the inmates are the ones in there sacrificing their lives, riding bulls. And they got one thing where they got a chip tied to a 2,000-pound bull head, and they get, give them money to get it off the bull's head, and they get yeah. slaughtered. Yeah. You know, so this is like a gladiator spectacle <laughs> on the cost of the prisoner's back to entertain, uh, uh, yeah. And make money off, but but anyway, so they got hobby shops and, and 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 prisoners make crafts and stuff like that, and they sell their stuff out there. And the ones that are trustees get to go out there and, and mingle with the public and sell their stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, and I go up there and I, and that's what I go do. I go holler at my brothers and, and, that are still in prison. Oh, so they got dudes, you know, that that I knew, you know, and I you know I I holler at them and shit, but they didn't holler. When I was right. when I was in the pit, you know, so yeah. I keep it cordial, you know. I don't have any resentments against, you know, life goes on or whatever, and uh, but I I don't pretty much. I'm tired of hanging with dudes, bro. I'm <laughs> trying to hang with chicks, you know. What I'm saying? <laughs> right, you have enough of that, right? Right. I'm tired of hanging with dudes. I mean, we still kick it every now and then, and we'll, we'll touch base and shit, you know. And like I said, no hard feeling, whatever, no life goes on. I mean, the lifestyle I was living, if you would have went to prison, I probably wouldn't have come. I'd have sent you a few dollars, you know, yeah. at least, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know if I would have drove five hours to come see you. Right, right, right. But, um, yeah, ain't no hard feelings with that, bro. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to see some of them, you know. They have one, one, of, one of my dudes, you know, I got in contact with him. I kind of, he was strung out on fentanyl, you know, and I'm like, bro, if you need help, you know, holler at me and... Two, three hours later, he called me. I brought him to a rehab, and he's doing good right now, bro. He's doing good. It's good to see him doing that. Dude, I mean, <laughs> I don't think there would be anything I could, I could, I could just tell my experience and hope that someone could get something from it. The majority won't. The majority have to go through what they got to go through in life, and just hopefully they make it out the other end alive. You know, statistically, most aren't gonna make it, you know. Um, I mean, just hang on, bro. Hang on and don't lose hope. Just keep one one mustard seed of faith and hope in something bigger than yourself, outside of yourself.